I'm Tess Garrison, and you should be watching the Crew Reviews. I'm Gary Braber, and I also suggest you watch the Crew Reviews. Let's welcome the writing dynamic duo for Choose Me, Tess Garrettson and Gary Braver. How are you? Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Welcome. Uh, for our audience, uh, would one of you uh, care to uh, show us from the 30,000 foot view of what this book is all about? Choose Me. I'll go. All right. Uh, here we go. Choose Me is about a Me Too situation, uh, an affair between a professor and his student. And we look at this affair and what can go wrong from both the male and the female point of view. Uh, and it opens up with the death of the, of the college student. So who did it? Was it him? Was it somebody else? All right. Um, when there's two highly accomplished writers deciding to um, co-author in this case, choose me, I would assume there's moments where you maybe don't agree necessarily on plot points or something within the project. Had, had the two of you come up with some sort of uh, game plan on how you're going to discuss the resolution of those uh, times that those pop up um, and any, any, maybe any instances where that happened and kind of give us a feel for what that looked like? I think what we can say, first of all, just going along with what Tess had said, is that the agreement was that we're going to examine both sides of an illicit affair between a professor and a student. Right. And Tess was, Tess was going to write the female point of view chapters, and I was, which includes Taryn, the, uh, the student, as well as Frankie, the female homicide detective. And I was going to do the point of view of Jack, who is the professor. Mm. Um, so, so that was the structure, that was the agreement. And um, so we started by, I sent her a, a chapter and Tess responded to that and went back and forth over emails over almost two years. Uh, in terms of um, making changes, um, uh, occasionally a few of the things I wrote ended up on the cutting room floor, but I've got a file, I'll recycle them. I'm, I'm green with my writing. <laughs> um, the material that, um, that might have been cut or, or truncated, I'll let, I'll let Tess take up because so she has something to do with some of the editing. Ah. I was mean. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure Gary can say, well, that bitch, he probably said that a couple of times. <laughs> um, but, but I think that the main issue that we, I was dealing with is I know who my, my audience is, and my audience is female, and I know what might offend them. And there were a couple of times when the male point of view came through a little too strongly. Um, mm. By strongly, I mean offensive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I learned a lot about how men think, um, and you can all chime in here if you agree with what I'm about to say. We all do men ahead of time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when men meet an attractive woman, their mind goes there, and you know where there is. Yep. Um, and when that would happen with this character of Jack Dorian, I, I said, I said to um, to Gary, no, this, this this may be realistic, but. It doesn't make us like this guy very much. Mm, yeah. So can you tone it down a little bit? And um, you know, I had to ask my husband. I said, "Do men really think this way?" And my husband said, "Yep, that's how we think." <laughs> so um, you know, it's, it's your second brain that's that's really paying attention to what the woman looks like. Sure. Uh, and so I, what I want to do is tone that down and 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 have their their relationship be on a much more, I mean, not just a physical level, but also that they're meeting, it's a meeting of the minds. And that's how women like to think that men think of us, but obviously yeah. it's not true. No. Yeah, some of us are better no. pretending that or the other. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, well, Gary, uh, you know, Tess is in other interviews, and this is, you know, pretty much expanding on what you were just saying, Tess, that you had the tougher, tougher job in writing the story that you had to take Jack uh, who had betrayed his wife and crossed all, all manners of lines, both physical, emotional, right. uh, and make them likable so as to not turn off readers. And 
I know there's no magic formula when creating characters, but how can an author like perfect, perfect that necessary skill of making the character likable and therefore not turn off the readers and have the reader close the book and put it away? Very like, good with guilt. <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> and uh, having been married for 40 years, I, I, there are moments when I can tap into my, my guilt roots. Uh, and in this case, hair, you know, just really amplify them, really, you know, really uh, water them and make them big. Yeah. I, I, I imagined how awful it would be if Jack got caught having an affair with a student. I mean, it's a violation of his marriage vow. It's a violation of, you know, his, his, his position as a college professor. I mean, you don't mess around with your students. You don't do that. It was right. done back in the 70s, but it's not done today. And Title IX guarantees that um, if you have any supervisory authority over a student like grades or a thesis advisor and you have a sexual relationship with that person that's a violation and you'll be terminated yeah. um so i needed to make him feel guilty and convincingly so i needed to make him feel regretful uh and convincingly so um and he's the kind of guy i imagine who would stand in front of the mirror and not say my wife made me do this or my students made me do this i made me do this I am the adult in the room. I screwed up badly. I should never have crossed that line. Uh, and so he does a lot of self browbeating. And I think that made him somewhat sympathetic, uh, at least to test his uh, audience and to, and to my wife and to myself. Um, <laughs> and I spent two years in this guy's head. And yeah. I imagine if I got caught, I mean, the two major pillars of my life would be toppled in my, my marriage and my, my career. Um, so it was really trying to make him contrite in a convincing way. Yeah. You know, I, I think this is what made this book a little quite different from most books is usually when we see heroes, they're people we can admire, they're, they're great people, they do the... In this case, we're starting off with a guy who does the wrong thing. How does he become a hero? And that was a, that was a challenge to make yeah. this the hero. Um, but I, but I think that you know Gary did a, a really good job of making us like Jack despite his foibles, um, and and I think that a lot of the emotions that we encounter in this particular book are not very pleasant. There, it's kind of a, a look at at life in in a way that we don't really ever want to look at life. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was that was the real challenge of of trying to come up with a situation that is by and large not very not very happy and everything goes wrong and people make mistakes but how do you make a mystery out of that and that was what was fascinating about this project yeah no kidding right well history is replete with people whose passions have overcome their rational processes and then <laughs> intelligent, intelligent people doing really dumb things and i think that's why this so true is going to resonate with everybody yeah. on either side of the equation um, and you guys did a wonderful job of showing the complexities of these characters and their situations you know it wasn't just um somebody out for a romp. It was, it was a, a, a several different factors that, that led into both of their decision makings. Um, when the Me Too movement came hit, and you said this was based in that, um, there was this long overdue reckoning for behavior that existed for centuries and, and was an open secret in modern times. But there was also, some may have argued, sort of overreach where every situation was painted with the same broad brush um, as if there, and if there were collateral damage, so be it. But Choose Me shows, or Choose Me, shows an illicit affair from both sides. Why was it so important for you to show both, both perspectives? And Tess, I'll start with you. Well, I think Choose Me has been seen largely through the lens of female eyes, um, where we don't really see what the male point of view is. Uh, we don't see what it's like to, to know you've made a mistake and how do you go on with your life and how do you ever, how, how can you ever be forgiven? So we wanted to, to look at that, but we, that the idea that you make a mistake, um, but is there, is there some way to rescue this person's life? And that's, mm. that, that's what um, mm. Gary was showing is that, yeah, there is, there, yeah, there is a tomorrow after you've done something like this. Right. Gary? But there is an element of forgiveness in this also. I mean, I, Jack has got to kind of forgive himself, um, but he's also, you know, we, Tess mentioned realism, realistic characters. Um, we not, neither wanted to exonerate either of the characters, nor do we want to vilify them. I mean, she's not Glenn Close in, you know, um, <laughs> uh, <Good>. attraction. Yeah. <laughs> um, that, that, that's just, you know, that's stacking the deck. We, it, that's, Become, it was done. We don't do that in this one. Um, 
Karen is sexy, she's sexual, she's brilliant, she's talented, she's available, and she's making moon eyes at Jack. So he has got to resist that in, in the best possible way. He's also bemoaning the fact that his wife has a treadmill kind of job as, as, a, as, a, uh, as a physician and comes home and she's scooped out. There's no time for snuggling up and all that. So he feels as if he's living a bachelor life again. Hmm. So when Taryn bec- makes it clear that she is available and she flatters him, she even says over lunch, would you, would you date your student, a student? And he says, no, absolutely not. I'm married. You know, and gives all the shibboleths there. Um, and she says, well, that's what I like about you. <laughs> you have a sense of loyalty. So she's flattering him at the same time she's coming on to him. So this is a kind of interesting complication that was going on. And he senses that. He keeps on telling himself, I'm the adult in the room. I'm the adult in the room. But allows himself to set up the temptation so that they both cross the line. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. It's not hard. I mean, guys, come on. You know, if you're <laughs> if you're in this situation, right? There's a beautiful woman, and she's available, and 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 maybe you're a little. You've been married for for a long time. How many would actually resist the temptation? And that, I think we we get up to that point in this story where I think. Well, I'm hoping all readers think I could have done that, or mm-hmm. I might have done that in a moment of weakness or a few too many drinks. Um, <laughs> Yeah. But Tess, my, my wife uh, carries a gun for a living, so I wouldn't do any of that shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's also that 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 saying that, that there's nothing more attractive than somebody who's attracted to you. Right. And I, I think yeah. given right. his situation, his wife and her treadmill job, as you mentioned, yeah. right. that I think really, it, it, it all read so authentic right. and true. I mean, right. Uh, I've seen it a few times at the hospital too, between, and Tess, you know this, I mean, you get somebody in a, in a position up there in the echelon and somebody comes in new and starts blinking their eyes. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's all there. It's life. It's, it's life. Yeah. It's, it's what it's like, to, you know, for, between men and women um, and work situations, no matter what the situation, this has happened again and again, since the beginning of time. So, you know, why not, why not address it? Right. In a way that doesn't try to make the bad guy the really bad guy, but make him in shades of gray. And that's what we wanted. We wanted characters who were shades of gray. Well, you guys are fast friends for a long time now, right? I, I think something in 20 plus years. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so being friends for a long time, were there any surprises uh, regarding what you thought it would be like to write together on a project? before starting the book versus what maybe you actually experienced after the fact? Well, the truth is we didn't think too much about it when we started. <laughs> right. Good point. I mean, it, was, it, it was a setting where we met at a cocktail party, um, a couple yeah. of different carabouts, and it all seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> That's how the show started. <laughs> That's true. So, yeah, you know, what really happened was that we started bouncing ideas back and forth. We agreed on some of the, the baseline rules, which is that I write the female points of view, he writes the male point of view. And we also decided that th- that the, the young woman would be dead at the very, well, we knew she would die, okay? Yeah. We just knew that she was gonna be dead. Um, but other than that, we hadn't agreed on who would, who did it, who the bad guy was, what happened. Uh, we did agree at a university setting because that was a natural for Gary, that's his, that's his day job. Sure. Uh, yeah, but I, I think that we were feeling our way through collaboration. Neither of us have collaborated before. Have, have right. collaborated before, so it was a lot of. There was a lot of learning to be done. Yeah. What was interesting is that um, I have read several of Tessa's books. Um, I have had her invited her to come to class. Um, I teach, of course, in, in bestsellers, and she's come four, four or five times over over a fifteen twenty year period. And so I knew her material and she has, was familiar with mine. She gave me some lovely blurbs. We got two thirds through the book and here are two inveterate writers. And we said, who did it? <laughs> and we knew who our candidates were. I mean, you know, we, we do this for a living. We knew who they were, but you, you have to, you know, this is, this is a murder mystery. It's built as a murder mystery. The, 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 the text on the back of the book says, you know, there's a body someplace. <laughs> and it's identified as Taryn. Um, so we had our candidates lined up, but you've got to be a few steps ahead of the reader because this is a guessing game. This is puzzle solving. Right. So we knew who the four or five possible candidates were, 
but we had to not pull a, pull a rabbit out of the hat at the end and the, the butler did it kind of thing. So it was back and forth. And, and this is where it, it was. This was fascinating to me yeah. because how about character A? Well, you know, if his character A mm, doesn't quite fit, you know, the, the character you built up, B and C. So he went right down the list and we finally decided, yes, this is who our killer is. We have to, like Rip was in a pond, you go back and have to jump all the previous chapters yeah, right. so that the no rabbit is being is pulled out of a hat at the end. And that was that was fun in many ways because we we watched the, the turnings of each other's minds. <laughs> <laughs> but we're equally sick, okay? So, I think the other thing is that, you know, who did it is not really that important. It, it really True. doesn't matter who the killer is. I think what mattered in this book was the journey. Yeah, uh, and, and I, that was what was most fascinating to me was watching this man's life spiral out of control. I mean, that was that was the drama. It wasn't uh, the catching of the killer. Right. I, I did like reading the end though, where we do find out. Who it is. <laughs> anyway. I did. That did. I did find that satisfying. Um, but that being said, you know, considering the the you know the current state of of the world, like with the, the Me Too movement, writing this story, it took lit, like literary guts, even even though it's it's fiction. Uh, yeah. yeah. Considering your your fans, test. So I wonder, did either of you either say to the other, while you were writing this thing, maybe we should shelve it for a little bit and start something different or not? I think there was a sense, at least from my point of view, is that. I could kind of catch a lot of crap for this hmm. um, yeah. because you know people are really there's a lot of black and white thinking in this world. There's not enough gray thinking, yeah. right. um, and and we knew we were going to get people who were going to be offended by the whole idea that we're even addressing this topic, or that we would actually make this man the hero after he'd done something wrong. So you know every time you write a book, there's there are always readers who are going to hate you for some yeah. reason or another. You know, maybe you made a pit bull the bad guy. Oh, the <laughs> pit bull fan coming out. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're we're dealing with something that could offend fifty percent of the population. Right. 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 Exactly. Yeah. And the other, the other thing that, that is interesting too about this, when I first started teaching um, back in, in, in the seventies, it was during the sexual revolution. It was during a time when there was liberalization and exploration of sexuality and the old shibboleths were being crumbled. And um, some of the cultural taboos, such as premarital sex, had fallen away. And it was back then, and I was a lot closer to my students' age, and so were a lot of other people who were hired in the English department, that professors, instructors were invited to parties. Yeah. The students, you're only a couple, a few years older than they, and they dated Three of my colleagues over the years married their students, Jeez. Um, and and no one no one looked the you know, no one was, you know slapped your wrist or said don't do that, and so it was interesting to see the kind of a historical evolution till we get to the eighties with the Title IX and women's basketball suddenly. Mm going to the, the the Department of Education, sending out these complicity um, um, policies that you cannot do this because it's a form of discrimination, discrimination against race and creed and, and, and um, religious uh, standings and sexual preference. But the, the, the taboos against, the, the com complicity taboos against gender were always kind of muted. It was hmm. in early 90s when a, a sociology professor got caught having sex with his student and the other people in the class knew and she didn't deserve all the A's and she got the A's. Um, and so it, the whistle was blown. This guy was fired on the spot in Northeastern where I teach, came down very, very hard on this. And, and every single restroom throughout the university, male and female, has this, this Title IX policy plaque that guarantees you protection against any kind of discrimination, particularly what we're talking about. Wow. So it, it's amazing what has happened in the last 40 years uh, re regarding yeah, the, no kidding. the females. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's actually yeah. a perfect segue in, into my next question. So you both drew on, on your experiences here, tests for Maggie's medical world, for Frankie as a mom, um, and the demands that the medical career can place on a marriage, and Gary for academia, and Jack's world parallels yours a great deal. He's almost an avatar. Um, aside almost, from almost. <laughs> but I'm curious, I'm curious, 
did you have any reservations about writing someone that was so close to you doing such things? I mean, was there ever a time where, <clears throat> excuse me, was there ever a time when you were worried that readers were going to be like, hey, is this guy confessing on the page? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was I was concerned, um, and um, there was some grumbling in the English department when I when it appeared in in print someplace in Boston that this book was coming out and this is what the storyline was, um, and, uh, and and a few people were just kind of you know, does he really have to do this? I mean, so he called it Commonwealth University, made made up university, yeah. even though early on I even thought about naming it Northeastern, <laughs> um, and, and so you know it was. <laughs> <laughs> I would have had people following me, you know. Yeah. Um, so that the point is, I, I felt I felt a, a sense of self consciousness, but this is not a memoir. This is right. not, you know, autobiographical, and I had no sense of guilt that I'm writing about something I had done. Um, and so the and the professorial stuff came in. Even this is interesting too, because my all the other books that I've written, the other seven of the nine books that I've done were medical thrillers, um, and because tests. Was, is a former doctor, when it got to the medical aspect, the medical elements, I said, test take over because you're, it's fresher in your mind. You used to yeah. do this for a living. So, yeah. and I just felt finally relieved from having to do the kind of technical research that I put into all the other books. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and test, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say, just playing off Gary, no matter what we write, people always assume that the characters we're describing are us. Yeah. That, that well, I'm a serial I, I, killer or that Gary's a Lothario. <laughs> you know, they just assume that we are all these horrible things that our characters do. Right. Can't get away from that. Dr. Death, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I have not murdered anybody. That's all. Yeah, well, yeah. My wife tells me all the time how she's going to do it in my sleep. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and and she's nice to you, doctor. So you know how yeah. drawn out that one's going to be. You're screwed. Uh, we talked a little bit about the, the process of what you guys lined up in terms of how you're going to write kind of like a loose knit, you know, set pieces and that sort of thing. But were there any examples of real surprises that came up in the last couple of years? in terms of specific scenes or what happened to, to particular characters that neither one of you envisioned, but just came out of the writing itself? I think the one thing that occurred to me, and this is something that, 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 that Tess initiated, is the structure of the book was chronological. And it was like chapter 20 something when we discovered that Karen is dead and either suicide or murder. Um, and our, our very, very competent uh, editor said, um, you finally introduced Frankie Lewis in chapter 20-something. She's great. I mean, you're, 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 your readers are going to love her. Move her up front. And then Tess took over from there and restructured the book uh, with a before and after structure we have now. Hmm. Yeah, yeah that, that was a major difference is that all of a sudden we we're doing a, this before and after thing. I think when it comes to characters revealing themselves, um, the best time to do it is while you're writing the story. Um, I never, I, I know I, Gary writes a little differently than I do. I never plot out anything. I never have a biographical sketch. I just see where the character takes me. And I think that what revealed itself to me was, was mostly was Frankie Loomis and the fact that hmm. you know, her husband... <laughs> Yeah, her husband was cheating on her when he died. He died in a very bad situation and yeah. she's dealing with that. So all these things come to echo back into this story because that affects her attitude towards Jack. And she's a cop and she automatically thinks the worst of men. Yeah. <laughs> I tell you, I think the nonlinear storytelling yeah. aspect worked so well throughout yeah. the book. I mean, it was, it was every time I, I really wanted to see the end of a scene, in a good way you guys pushed me to another scene so i had to wait and so the anticipation kept built in and then <laughs> i would want to know the end of the other storyline and it was it was yeah. a, just a, it propels you through the book um but you just mentioned something and i want to have a question so if i'm not mistaken tess you write your first drafts in pen and paper right i do okay so was there a big time lag from from you sharing with Gary? Did you fax in pages, or did you have to type mail. already written? I type really fast. I, it's okay. just I can't think on the computer, so I think on paper, and then I type it in, and then I send it to him. Um, and and it was funny the way the structure worked is that he would send me a chapter, and then my character would react to his character. So it was really like one upping each other, but not us. It was our characters who were doing this to each yeah. other. Um, and our characters are pretty cruel to each other. I yeah, <laughs> that's true. 
I kind of love that idea though, or you were like, Hey, now here's the, here's the chapter deal with it. <laughs> right. Like, yeah, that's, that's what it was. That, that really was. Yeah. Especially Tara, you know, that the part of the young woman was a challenge to me because I had to understand why she would do the things she did. She's, mm -hmm. she's a complicated, needy, um, somewhat destructive young woman. Why would you become that way? And now mm -hmm. I really had to, had to go back to, you know, when, when you, you've broken up with a lover, how far do you, how, how hard is it to let go? Um, how much do you, do you do a little stalking, cyber stalking maybe, or drive by their house and take a look at who they're dating now? I think a lot of people do that. I, I just, I did that with Taryn, but I just put it up a couple notches higher <laughs> when she actually <laughs> breaks into his apartment and steals yeah. his t-shirt so she can smell them when, when she's or, gone. Or, or go to his wife's work. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, was that a great scene? I love that scene. That was so much fun. I, I thought that was ingenious. Yes. Yeah, I, I was. Love that, too. <laughs> that, that was intense. But so another intense scene was when uh, Gary was the one you wrote uh, when Jack confesses to his wife about his affair and how he's a suspect. Right. Um, but I'm so I'm curious as me as a writer, more, more writers like I ping stuff off my wife all the time. Like, hey, how's this sound? How's this dialogue sound? I wonder did you use did you use anybody to ping off of did you use oh, test? did you use your wife or was it all internally absolutely absolutely it's, 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 it's kathy um we love the renoir painting where they had where he had proposed to her x number of years ago he tells her in kind of code meet me at, at where i propose to you and he goes there and he's going to confess to her that that student who died last week um, I was very close to her. She came to me for, for because she was needy. Well, I had an affair with her, mm -hmm. and she's dead now. And the police suspect murder, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm number one suspect. You know, um, and I and I, I love that scene. It just rolled out of me because I imagine me talking to Kathy in front of the Renoir people. By the way, I may be a murderer. You know? <laughs> Maybe, do you remember all the good feelings we had here? I'm about to <laughs> shit on them. That was the, the scene was great because it was so painful. It was oh, such yeah. a painful scene. And it's something that's designed to make readers squirm, which is why it's such a great oh, scene. It did. It, did. <laughs> it sure did. Yeah, it, was, it reminds me of the old joke, though. Um, Dad, I'm pregnant. What? what? No, just kidding. I wrecked the car. <laughs> 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 okay, I can live with that. Right. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> well, Tess, through Frankie and Maggie, um, you had a lens to look at uh, the mistakes of this younger character and Taryn from a more mature woman's perspective. And looking at your background, it's clear you made a habit of making good choices in your life. <laughs> and so the, the motherhood aspect you can, you know, is, is you can pull from your life, the doctor aspect you can pull from your life. Was there something in particular you were able to draw from to create Taryn and her obsessive self-sabotaging behavior? Yeah, I raised teenagers. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I I the boys, that. boys are way staner than boys are way, yeah, well, okay, Boys are less complicated. But oh, yes. you know, if, if you've been a parent, you know <laughs> that being a parent is really difficult. It's a difficult job. And then you're dealing with young people who make really stupid choices. <laughs> and you know, no matter how much wisdom you try to Listen to you, and that's what I was thinking was um, of when I was writing Taryn. She's no, she's 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 not going to listen to any wisdom from an older person, um, and that's what I loved about Frankie is that she has two teenagers who are kind of difficult, smart but difficult, <laughs> and so when she comes across this dead college student, she can read the clues. There's something wrong here. This was not a suicide. She knows because she's a mom. Um, and I, I just, I love the older characters. As I get older, I like to write about older women because, you know, there's wisdom there. There's, there's experience. Right. And they, they are the best cops of all. Yeah, so true. Uh, yeah, I have two teenagers and I can completely confer, concur with that. Uh, uh, so my question, uh, I uh, lean a little bit towards Tess, although Gary, please uh, feel free to, um, to chime in. Um, I recently was talking with Robin Cook on the issue of medical speak within novels, uh, which is a very common topic, and the difficulty of finding that sweet spot between dumbing down the material just enough where you're not talking over their heads, um, but not 
over, you know, using complicated, complicated jargon and medical procedural type stuff. So, and he said, and Robin said, let it fly, use it all if you want, which is okay for him to say, but uh, <laughs> Tess, do you have any specific rules you follow or is it all pretty much innate now what you know works within novels for the, for the general audience? Oh, well, I want doctors to talk like doctors. So they are going to use medical jargon, but mm -hmm. the way I get that across to the late reader is to make sure that medical jargon is somehow imbued with emotion. Uh -huh. um, so when you hear a doctor say, oh my God, he's in VTAC, yeah. you don't need to know what VTAC is. You need, you just know it's a bad thing. Right. Uh, and I think that's all your reader is, is trying to get is, is this a good thing or is this a bad thing? Mm. Um, the, other, the other trick that is really helpful is to have a lay person in the scene who needs things explained to him. Oh. Uh, and then the doctor can say, well, this is why it's a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I think that when you get to technical issues, it's important for people to talk the way they, they would. If you saw two doctors who were talking and said, Mrs. Smith just had a heart attack, that immediately strikes you as being inauthentic. Yeah. So, so I, think, I think it's really important to have, um, to have authentic dialogue, but somehow to imbue it with enough context so that the reader understands that this is important or this is not important. Right. Gary, have you learned anything about that, those roles in, in, in your books as well? Uh, I, I, having a, a lay person in a scene is, allows you to simplify it. Um, I, I had, a, in a book called Flashback, I had a discussion between a neurologist and a pharmacologist, and, and he tests her to say, tell me how Alzheimer's works on the brain. And I said, this is going to be a killer because I, yeah. I, I, first of all, I am going to have to invent stuff. <laughs> Secondly, I'm going to have to have people talking without dumbing down at a level that is high. So I, I, I introduced a third person in the scene and it, exactly what, what Tess is talking about so that the, the, the average reader would know that, you know, first of all, the doctors have to, the professors have to, professionals have to talk down into, into the level that the average reader could pick up and, and not the, blinded by the science so uh, that, that's a great strategy but um yeah i always have someone who is a little less informed than the the pro in the room that brings another question to mind um you guys are both tess you were a physician gary you were a physicist or on your way to being a physicist it, right, right. well it's it's really interesting to see people who start off um, and I don't remember which is left and which is right, but who start off right brain, become left brain or, or whatever. Have you always both been tapping into both hemispheres of your brain or did you just find <laughs> out, hey, I'm not this, I should be this? Oh, I think we both had a similar journey as I, I knew I was a writer way before I became a doctor. Uh, but I come from, you know, kind of conservative Chinese American families. Where <laughs> they all they all say you must feed yourself first, and they yes. never believed that I could ever make a living as a writer. Uh, so that's, I started off as you know I became a doctor, and then um, after I went on maternity leave, I thought, hey, I can write a book while I'm on my baby sleeping. And that's how it all got started. Right. You sure, she did. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, I think you've both survived the regular portion of our interview. So mm -hmm. congratulations to that. Hopefully we didn't ruin yes. your careers at any point in time there. We're on to now what's called the lightning round. And this is the round where very little thought was put into the questions and we require very little thought to your answers. And so <laughs> I'm today's host and we're going to uh, start off with, all right. So my first question is this, Gary. Does Tess have any physical tells when she doesn't particularly like something that you wrote or think there's a better way that you could have written it? When, when she would, when, we, everything was, was conveyed by emails. When she said, hi, Gary, it was something nice. When she wrote, Gary, I think you better look at the scene. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think he sounds a little sexist, you know, but she, she had a kind way of, of tamping down what she didn't like to see. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, my question is for Tess. So let's put you in a little scenario. You've sustained a traumatic brain injury and you subsequently agreed to take on the role of the head of the American Medical Association, which is what would be required to take that role. <laughs> if you could make one change to the organization with a stroke of a pen, what would it be? Oh my God, what a terrible yeah. question. <laughs> <laughs> I would say we need twice as many medical schools. Let's see what we can do about this. All right. I like it. 
Yeah. Well, here's a doctor shortage. Well, the yeah. physicians are like this and here's all the hospital administrators numbers going up. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Making more money. Too. All right. So my last question is we're going to test your friendship knowledge. Gary, <laughs> if Tess were to kill someone, what would be her preferred method? <laughs> um, I think she would find a compound that would be so invisible in a person's system that it would look like, you know, a, a cardiac arrest, you know, maybe a, a curare with the, uh, the pygmies use in, 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 in Africa and in the, in the, uh, there's the rainforest of killing monkeys and things. <laughs> right, he's right. All right, he's well, right. We, we expect that in the next book. All right. Um, Tess, if Gary were to pursue a new career as a physician, which specialty or subspecialty should he not go into and why? Oh, oh, proctology. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> who wants to do that? Yeah. No. Is the why necessary? No. no. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> One answer for two questions. Thank you. Yeah. So that's pretty much the essence of the lightning round. So yeah. uh, here we go. <laughs> All right, Gary, you've written your next book. Well, once again, there's been a publishing snafu, not to bring up bad memories. Um, there's 20 pages of another book in the beginning of your book. 40 well, pages. Well, yeah, I know. But in this, <laughs> <Who comes? laughs> this time, it's only 20 pages. And here's the catch. I'm going to let you pick which 20 pages of a book are in it. I think the first 20, first 20 pages of Pet Cemetery by Stephen King. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's the mood. I would have said 50 Shades of Grey. Yeah. But... <laughs> yeah. All right. People were very confused by the ending of that book. <laughs> True. All right, Tess, if you had to write a piece of music for Choose Me, what would you title it? Crazy Girl. I, I, I don't know. Would it, would it be with a violin this time? <laughs> yeah, I think it would be a screeching violin that has a lot of dystonic, dystonic sounds to it. Oh, so, yeah. I love it. I love it. All right, uh, Gary, here's, here's my last question. Uh, Tess is coming over for dinner to your house. Uh, what's the one dish you can't or won't serve her? Roast pig. <laughs> Roast pig. roast pig. I'd go for that. I would yeah. go for that. <laughs> now I want roast pig. The, the truth is yeah, there is no there's no dish you can't serve me because I eat it all. Uh, right, 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 right. Yeah. There it is. I was joking because you're, you're, of your video, your movie with your son. Yeah, yeah. I know, I know. <laughs> all right. I, I have one absurd one and two that aren't that bad really. <laughs> what my standards. Um, okay. The first, the absurd one is, and and you each have to answer this. You are about to risk everything, your job, your reputation, your marriage, but it's not for an affair. It's for <laughs> fill in the blank. My kids. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So Same not, here. Ditto. <laughs> chocolate or anything. <laughs> it's sort of an automatic answer for any yeah. parent, I think. Yeah, I should have I should have excluded kids and made it really interesting. <laughs> dog. So, um, <laughs> My dog. <laughs> The next one is for you, Tess. You had a parent who was a chef, I believe. Is that correct? Okay. So what is your go-to meal when you want to impress someone? Oh, um, porchetta. Porchetta. That, that, that takes so much work. And yet you get to get the pork belly and you've got to burn off the little bristles. And then you have to put the herbs on. You have to roll it up. And yeah, it's... it's um, is that I, your thing? Do you, you do that really? That's awesome. I, I've only made it twice, and I, I think that I would rather go to a restaurant and have some. <laughs> <laughs> Probably right. A good deal. All right, Gary, the last one's for you. So you, if I'm not mistaken, were friends with Mr. Robert B. Parker, the late Robert B. Parker. Wow, yeah. awesome. Yes. What is the one single piece of advice that he gave you that sticks out above all? Oh. Or tip, whatever. Right. Um, one piece of advice is something I've quoted in the past. He said, look at another person's work the way a carpenter looks at a house. Study how they get in and out of a scene. Look at the angle. Look at the structure. Look at the economy of, of, of characterization. And he said, study. Study the book. Don't, don't, don't just read it for, for plot. And, and, I, um, and he also, so one other thing he said was, um, 
uh, he was just a few desks away from me. And I said, I want to write a novel too. And he said, but I have 350 pages. It's like, you know, a, a, a wallet the size of a basketball for a squirrel, you know? So he <laughs> said, don't think about 350 pages. Think of it as 35, 10 page chapters and go from there. And I just kind of, and then I watched him demythologize the process because that's what he did. He wrote five pages a day, you know, 20 pages a week, whatever it was. And he did a book. So it was watching him and seeing how he made it seem quite easy. Of course, he was the most verbal human being I've ever met in my life and one of the brightest. So, I mean, it, you know, he's, um, he had that great advantage, but he, yeah. Um, yeah That's awesome. Remarkable. That's awesome. I, I had, love that. That's one cool. of our most recent guests was Ace Atkins, yeah. who of course is. Oh, I, yeah. I know Ace. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Guy. And I, yeah. I remember, I remember when Ace Atkins first Parker book came out, I was wishing him that he'd fall on his face. That'd be horrible. <laughs> and we ended up being on WBUR television in Boston with, with, with Joan Parker and he, and I said, you know, you are channeling big Bobo. I mean, you, he, he, he I don't, you didn't miss at all. You probably have read some Parker and you've had uh, Ace on the show. Yeah. Um, rather remarkable what yeah. he's able to do. I mean, he's, I mean and I, he's and awesome. Parker and I were like the brothers we never had. I read everything he wrote. So I, I was just astounded how accurate he was in, in capturing that voice. Did, well, speaking he say, of remterable and capturing voices. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You guys this was did. a master oh, yeah. class on collaboration <laughs> right here. Every, every character was a real, a real person. I mean, it, you, yeah, I, I had no, no suspension of disbelief imagining any of these people. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. The, some really again, awesome is, scenes. Yeah, some it, awesome scenes. It was a master <laughs> class on collaboration too. So if anybody's thinking about writing a book, follow, follow <laughs> these folks. This was fantastic, and uh, um, we want to wish you the best on your individual careers and. Uh, I don't know if you can say whether or not there might be some more collaboration down the road, but I know your audience would love to see that. So just to keep that in the back of the mind. <laughs> so Cheers. thank you both for coming on the show. It was wonderful to talk to you and catching up on your book. Thank you, gentlemen. Yes, it's thank great. You. Hope to fun. see you at the next yeah. gathering, wherever we can have one. So mm. right. okay. Cheers. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> bye bye. Yes. Boys, yes. we had Tess Gerritsen and Gary Braver on the show today. Nice, nice, and their nice. they collaboration, that? Choose Me, a Who Done It. And this was fantastic. And boy, did I learn a lot on today's episode as well. So yeah. let's grab your drink. And remember, folks, join us every Monday for another best selling and best selling guest and guests. Cheers. Cheers to you. I thought you were going to count down for yourself oh. there, big boy. <laughs> right. Go. You're up. Here we go. What and are we doing? We're doing. Um, what was that? What are we doing? Uh -huh. ah, I guess we're just doing choose me in three, two, two and me. me. I'd like to say that over again. <laughs> <laughs> uh I've never done that in two years. No, that's, never done that. no, that's a first. <laughs> Tessa's got me all excited being here. So I'm like, oh, oh, yay. All right, boys. Yes. We had a fantastic show today. Yeah. Ooh. And put that back up there. <laughs> Bro, what, listen. What, it's what, like, you know what that's like? It's like when... when the FBI is tapping your phone. Make the call quick. Dude, I know how long I got to be up there. <laughs> um, why don't you shoot me that uh, after the show? All right. Oh, all right. Here we go. It was. Uh, yeah. Well, that's on the director's cut. Yep. All right. Yep. Three, two, and me. Yeah.